Hello ladies and gentlemen, well it appears the United Kingdom Government Communication Headquarters, or GCHQ, have put out some end-user device security guidance for Ubuntu 18.04. This has actually been published by the National Cyber Security Centre, which as they're saying is part of GCHQ. So I'm going to take a look through this guide and discuss it, I'm not actually going to run it on my system. The guide is aimed more at enterprise users rather than home users. So for a single home user system, this is perhaps a little bit over the top. Not, not just a little bit, it's completely over the top. So I'm a bit surprised to read that all data should be routed over a secure enterprise of VPN to ensure confidentiality, integrity of the traffic, and to benefit from enterprise protective monitoring solutions. Well, that is perfectly a valid advice for enterprise users. I'm a bit surprised that it seems to contradict what the government were going for last year. Theresa May's repeated calls to ban encryption still won't work, so I just picked up an article from the New Scientist. Although this is perhaps talking more about internet encryption or HTTPS, or encryption of messaging services, we can consider virtual private networks, or VPNs, a form of encryption. Left hand, right hand situation here? We're continuing to look at the architectural choices for Ubuntu 18.04 LTS. Users should not be allowed to install arbitrary applications on a device. Applications should be authorised by an administrator and deployed via a trusted mechanism. Oh, absolutely, I wish we did more of that in the company I work for. Instead of the situation we have at the moment, where we do have a trusted mechanism to install applications and updates, some users have administrative rights and go and install what they want from the internet. And that comes on to the third point, that most users should have accounts with no administrative privileges. Users that require administrative privileges should use a separate, unprivileged account for email and web browsing. It is recommended that local administrator accounts have a unique, strong password per device. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I know on Linux we do have to consider that we have the use of sudo to elevate rights up to root level. Now, that's fine for home users, but in an enterprise, you don't want the average user to have that option. I don't see anything wrong with having the sudo option as a home user, and, but perhaps if you do want to go over and above on security, you could use two different accounts. One unprivileged account for your day-to-day -day browsing and whatever you want to do on a computer, and another account you log into occasionally to elevate your rights up to root and carry out any maintenance of updates and new install of applications. So when configured this way, risk owners should be aware of the following technical risks associated with this platform. And they go through various different risks, so data in transit, users may choose the option to ignore certificates leaving data in transit vulnerable to interception and alteration. Well, yeah, you want to get away from self-signed certificates as much as possible. Data at rest, the Linux unified key setup, LUX or LUKS, slash dmcrypt disk encryption solutions have not been independently assured to foundation grade and do not support some of the mandatory requirements expected from assured full disk encryption products. I wonder if that's a case of that the standards need to be paid for and perhaps open source products don't have that ability. Without assurance, there is a risk that data stored on the device could be compromised. However, the TPM Lux project can enable the use of trusted platform modules, TPMs by Lux, which help meet more of these requirements. Fair enough. Secure boot. Ubuntu does not use any dedicated hardware to protect its disk encryption keys. If an attacker can get physical access to the device, they can perform an offline brute force attack to recover the encryption password. I believe there might be an option in Hashcat to carry out such an attack. But yeah, that's physical access to the device. That's not something that can be done over the internet. An external interface protection. Whilst not specific to Ubuntu itself, many devices which can run Ubuntu have external interfaces which permits direct memory access, DMA. From connected peripherals, this presents a local attacker with an opportunity to exfiltrate keys and data. Software configuration of the Firewire and Thunderbolt interfaces can reduce the risk for these interfaces. So I have given out some recommendations, which we've kind of covered already. Some further information about Secure Boot, so they suggest to enable Secure Boot. Ubuntu validates the boot process but does not verify all boot-related files against tampering. 
Security benefits can be obtained by applying configuration given in that guide, but this will not fully satisfy the Secure Boot recommendation. Platform integrity and application sandboxing, these requirements are met implicitly by the platform where available. AppArmor profiles limit applications access to the platform. Other applications can be configured to use AppArmor if required. Snap applications run confined in a restricted sandbox. So all that out of the box. Application whitelisting, permissions can be configured at install time to ensure users cannot execute applications from any disk partition that they can write to. All application installations should be performed by an administrator. Malicious code detection and prevention. The platform implicitly provides some protection against malicious code being able to run when configured as recommended. Several third-party anti-malware products exist which attempt to detect malicious code for this platform. The content-based attacks can be filtered by your in-house scanning capabilities. So yeah, this is talking about enterprise, which is well and above what a home user would have access to. They are mentioning antivirus there, but they're not specifically stating that you must use it. Device updates, operating system security updates can be configured automatically applied using the recommended software update settings. Application updates are installed automatically when a device is switched on and fully booted. Snap applications are automatically updated by default multiple times a day. I think it was four times a day. Additionally, canonical live patch can be configured to dynamically patch the kernel at runtime. Otherwise, kernel updates are effective upon restart. Event collection. By default, the majority of applications on Ubuntu will use our syslog to output event logs. And the syslogs can be forwarded to a remote server. Additional auditing can be performed with Audit D for specific events of interest to an administrator. For incident response, there is no native remote wipe functionality available for Ubuntu, but remote wipe functionality can be implemented with a configuration management system such as Puppet. Access to enterprise network can be prevented by revoking VPN client certificate associated with a lost or stolen device. Ah, is that why we're suggesting to use VPNs? They've drawn a recommended network architecture, which is very standard really. There's your services behind a firewall and reverse proxy. You have a VPN gateway, an external firewall, and then there's the untrusted WAN, and then you've got end user devices. So that's kind of more for remote working really, or I suppose, or access from multiple different sites. Yeah, that diagram's perfectly fine. They're talking about preparation for deployment. Again, this is on the enterprise level using a pre-seed file and post-install script. And it goes into detail of what exactly you need to do. So in particular, this is configuring the grub menu, replacing the default boot options that are provided by Ubuntu. A home user would not need to go through this at all. The authentication policy, well, it recommends installing libpam pw quality, a standard application that's available within the Ubuntu repository. and. And that ensures passwords are set to minimum lengths and checks against known passwords. It's forcing a screen lock timeout. Again, perfectly fine for the enterprise environment to stop other people messing around your computer if you leave it unattended. Of course, that's a dangerous game to leave it unattended in my line of work. <laughs> you definitely don't want to do that. You'll find your computer thoroughly abused and your pay sent to someone else's bank account. Boot process hardening, well that's to force secure boot, and it's just basically some changes to the grub boot file. Software management and automatic updates, yeah this is all perfectly fine. A software restriction, now this is an interesting concept, so what it requires you to do is to install folders into different partitions on your hard drive, and that gives you the option to set no executable within the slash etc slash fstab file makes it considerably harder for a remote attacker to start executing applications on your system. AppArmor configuration, so that's making better use of AppArmor, which is actually pre-installed on the system. So that's installing profiles and AppArmor utilities. The applications where the AppArmor profile has been enforced on, that's perfectly fine to do as a home user, as well as an enterprise user. Now reducing shell access, good idea. Privacy. Well, this is an interesting section and uh, something I've discussed before with Ubuntu and been slated over, but 
They're recommending disabling the Apport error reporting, whoopsie daisy, the popularity contest, or removing the popularity contest, which will render your system supposedly impossible to upgrade, more like it will do long-term damage to the system. Yeah, interesting they're recommending that, and I wonder if they're going to get hauled over the coals for giving such advice. Or maybe I'm just jealous at this point, I don't know. So talking about VPNs, yeah, that's up to you if you want to run it as a home user, but yeah, for an enterprise user, good idea. Firewall, this is generally something you don't really need to do as a home user, unless you're running a server at home and you want to limit access to it. So if you want to limit access to it from only your home network or from specific IP addresses, so you want to prohibit access to the ports or various TCP and UDP ports. By default, there are no remotely accessible ports open in Ubuntu, and therefore you don't need a firewall to protect anything. So other considerations, we've got application whitelisting, auditing, so external interface protection, so disabling Firewire, Thunderbolt, Express Card, PCI, PCI Express. So yeah, they go into a bit of length about it and they show you what you need to do. And that's it really. I can't see anything that's a detriment to security or would allow further snooping from GCHQ. It's some good advice for an enterprise setup of Ubuntu. As I've said, for a home user it is perhaps a little bit too much, but there may be some considerations you might want to take from here. Well, thanks for watching. I'll see you all later. Bye.